Thank you for tuning into this special presentation of the novel The Dead Kids Club by Rich Hosek, read for you in its entirety on the Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs Fiction Podcast. The Dead Kids Club is what I like to call an everyman thriller, ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. It follows a divorced couple after the death of their son and asks the question, what would you do if the killer of your child got away with it? How far would you go to get the justice you deserve? The revenge you need? And how will you know when you're done? The complete book will be serialized over the next several months, between my usual short story episodes. I caution you that unlike most of the content on this podcast, The Dead Kids Club is a gritty thriller depicting scenes of graphic violence and mild sexual content. So, if you're sensitive to that type of material, you've been warned. Please visit bedtimestories.studio to subscribe to my mailing list so you don't miss any chapters of this unabridged audio presentation and news about my upcoming thriller, The Tenth Ride. And now, Part 13 of The Dead Kids Club by Rich Hosek. 18. At breakfast, I tell Rebecca about Mikey. She brushes it off. He won't get to me, she insists. Don't worry. Easy for her to say. I know what you're trying to do, Rebecca says plainly. What's that? I ask. Trying to get me to back off killing Berman? I keep thinking there's too much attention on us. Look, she says. I know you already have a way around Vitaly's guys in Manzanetti. She's right. I have thought of something that might work. Well, just because there may be a way doesn't mean... Come on, she interrupts. You know that's just an excuse. He's been deserving it longer than any of them. You told me yourself that Barb and Brian are going through a real rough patch, and you know, despite all the touchy-feeling stuff Barb spews, that they need this. God, over ten years. Can you imagine? I can't. What I can't imagine is the million and one things that can go wrong. All the eyes that are on us for one reason or another. Perhaps Eddie Horn stumbling across the missing piece of the puzzle that will tie Rebecca and me to all these murders. Hell, do we really believe that other parents in the group haven't put it all together? And that Brian, at least, after bearing his soul to me, won't realize that we are the ones responsible when Berman is killed? This is a bad idea, getting worse by the minute. Rebecca smiles. You worry too much, she tells me, and gives me a kiss on the cheek. See you later. I'm going out baby shopping with Amy. She's at the door before I can check her purse for a small handgun. 19. I pull into the movie theater parking lot, checking my rearview mirror for the ever-present goon squad. They follow me into the lot, parking where I can see my car and the entrance to the theater. I pretend that I don't know that they're there, imagining that they are living under the delusion that they're just that good. I leave my keys on top of the front wheel, hidden by the fender, and head into the theater. They don't follow me in, instead taking up a position to watch my car, which is what I was hoping for. I left my phone and wallet at home, walking out with just a handful of cash. With my keys hidden, there's nothing on me that can be tracked. I choose a long-running movie, one that, according to the display behind the cashier, has already started and pay with cash. I skip the concessions, tuck my stub into a back pocket, and make my way to the far end of the building where there is an emergency exit. Typically, there is an usher there who keeps high school kids from letting their friends in. But at this time of day, the very first matinees are starting, and the theaters are mostly empty. I deck out into the bright sunlight and cut through an alley. As I walk, I change out the reversible jacket I'm wearing, don sunglasses, and a plain baseball cap I had tucked inside, and head toward the train station down the street. Once I'm at the station, I locate the bicycle I'd stashed there a few days earlier, unlock it, and start pedaling toward the address of Justin Berman's secret apartment. It takes me nearly half an hour. Halfway through, I take off the jacket and tie it around my waist. I'm working up a bit of a sweat. The route is mostly uphill. Fortunately, that means the return trip will be easier. The apartment is in a low-rent neighborhood. I try to make myself as inconspicuous as possible and search for a spot I can stash the bike. I circle the apartment building, then find a gate that is out of view from the street, chain the bicycle to it, and circle around to the front. There is no security on the building. The door to the atrium where the mailboxes hang on one wall is unlocked. I check the box for the apartment number Berman leases. There is no name. There are also no security cameras, and the phone that at one time acted as an intercom to ring tenants from the atrium is missing its handset and half of the buttons. 
Berman's place is on the first floor. I walk down the hall and find his apartment at the far end. Some of the other apartments are obviously abandoned. The doors are missing. His door is locked. I jiggle the knob anyway and test the strength of the door with my shoulder. But despite the disrepair of the rest of the building, the door is unyielding. There's a back door to the building. It too is unlocked. I walk out into the meager yard that is a few feet of gravel and weeds demarcated by a chain-like fence which has several gaps in it. I walk around the perimeter of the building, locating the windows that look into Berman's apartment. They are dirty, but I can see inside. One window opens into a kitchen, another into a bedroom, and a smaller one into what I assume is the bathroom. All of them are covered with rusted iron grates. The bathroom window is higher than the others and looks like it is open a crack. I grab the grate and try to pull myself up. My weight pulls the upper mounts of the grate away from the wall, and I realize the whole thing is not really attached at all. The screws that hold it in place have long since been stripped from the exterior of the building, and it's likely that Berman himself has used it to gain entry when he's forgotten his keys or wanted to come and go unnoticed. I lift and pull, and the grate comes free. I set it against the wall and use it as a miniature ladder to boost myself up. The window swings open, and I gain purchase with my elbows, then wriggle my way in. There is a sink below the window. I hold on to it so I can ease myself in without damaging the fixtures, the window, or myself. I pause for a moment, making sure there is no one in the apartment who heard my illicit entry. Then I slowly step out of the bathroom into the bedroom. There's an actual bed in the corner. The bedding is surprisingly clean. For some reason, I had pictured a ratty mattress on the floor with vomit-stained sheets, but obviously Berman wanted some place nice enough to entertain his hookups. I pass through the living area, which is home only to a chair pointed at a television, and enter the kitchen. There's a table paired with a couple chairs. It's fairly clean, though sparse. I open the fridge, and I'm not surprised to find it chilling a couple cases of beer. The freezer is home to a bottle of vodka. I begin searching the cabinets, the closets, looking for anything incriminating or anything to verify that I was on the right track. There are a couple of utility bills with Berman's name on them. Under the bed there's a stash of condoms and a pair of handcuffs, along with some other sex toys that likely come in handy on the occasion he's not able to perform himself. In the bathroom, I check the cabinets, medicine chests, and linen closets. Nothing but the bare necessities. I lift the lid off the toilet tank and find a bag taped to its underside. No one could accuse him of being original. There looked to be enough white powder inside to garner a felony conviction. I take it and start searching for an alternate hiding place. There is a wall heater that has a little flap that opens to tend the pilot light. It's been painted shut, but a little scoring from a kitchen knife loosens it enough for me to open it and stuff the bag up and out of the way of the tiny blue flame. It's summer, and unlikely that Berman will be using the heater, but I turn off the gas regardless. A plan formulates in my mind, just as Rebecca predicted. I imagine Berman coming home to his illicit bachelor pad, hoping to score a hit from his stash, and instead finding only the clean underside of the toilet tank lid. He furiously starts tearing the place apart. Rebecca and I are watching from outside. As he makes his way through the house and starts emptying drawers and cabinets in the kitchen, we sneak into the bathroom, through the window, then lay in waiting in the bedroom. He storms back into the bedroom, and from behind I bash him over the head with the same toilet tank lid. Hopefully he is at least stunned, if not unconscious. We use the handcuffs to bind him to the bed. I retrieve the stash of drugs and pour it directly into his mouth. I imagine its ingestion will be enough for a fatal overdose. To make sure, we'll smother him with a pillow. Obviously, it will be seen as a murder, but in this part of town, and considering the circumstances, that will only serve to bring attention to Berman's covert activities. I take a towel from the kitchen and wipe down every surface, even ones I know I didn't touch. I brush away the paint chips I left from loosening the heater hatch, then put the bathroom back the way I found it. I take the towel with me as I wriggle back out the window and use it to wipe down the glass and the grate after I place it up against the wall and push the screws back into place. I check my watch. There's plenty of time for my downhill bike ride back to the movie theater. I walk back into the alley to where I left the bike locked and find only the cleaved chain in a heap on the ground. 20. I look around and see a couple kids down the alley, snickering at me. I smile at them, then curse myself for being so careless. The bike could conceivably be traced back to me, but I can't think of that now. Obviously, I'm not going to confront them. Instead, I offer a friendly wave, which they return with a chorus of middle fingers, and I turn and retreat down the other end of the alley. Shit, what was going to be a leisurely bike ride 
is now going to be a run. I need to cover almost six miles. If I was in shape, I could do that easily in under an hour. But I haven't been running since that day Rebecca and I first decided we were going to kill Vitaly. Fortunately, the downhill grade I was counting on to make my return ride a breeze will help with the run. I start off at an easy jog, then settle into a pace I feel I can keep up for a while. I barely make it a block when the kids from the alley appear, riding bikes. One of them mine. Hey, lose something? They chide. I try to ignore them and keep running. Are you lost, old man? One asks. Another one of them rides the front tire of his bike into my calf. I stumble and almost take a spill, but regain my footing and continue on. The assorted delinquents laugh and urge their friend to try to do it again. I'm able to leap quickly to the side and avoid his assault. Hey, another one calls out. You look like you can use a vacation. I smile at him, hoping they'll tire of me soon. Or at least a short trip, he adds. I don't see the miscreant who has biked up on my other side. He sticks a foot out from his bike and catches my ankle. This time I don't recover and hit the ground, hard. I manage to break most of my fall by putting my hands out, but my palms take a major scraping along the pavement, which also happens to be littered with tiny rocks and broken glass. Then I roll onto my shoulder and bang the back of my head against the curb. Momentum carries my body forward, and I feel the tip of my nose scrape along the rough cement, and my knees take a beating as well. Finally, the elbow that had recently been freed from its cast bangs against a metal signpost. At first, shock prevents me from feeling the full effects of the fall, but after a moment, the pain sets in. First in my palms, they feel as if they are on fire. Then my knees and elbows ring in pain. Then a throbbing begins where my head banged against the curb. The kids who orchestrated my literal downfall exchange fist bumps and hoot and holler as one of them searches my pockets for anything of value. Fortunately, since I had left my wallet and phone at home, the only thing they find is a change from my movie ticket and my $50 watch, which they take from my wrist, then right away. I lie still for a moment, my eyes closed, half expecting a barrage of kicks or taunts to add insult and additional injury to my injury. But none is forthcoming. I manage to sit up and take in my surroundings. A few people across the street see me stir and then continue on their way. No one offers to help, which is just as well. I don't want to have to explain myself to anyone about why I'm in this part of town with no wallet or phone. I struggle to my feet, careful not to press my palms against anything. They are raw and oozing blood. Ragged pieces of skin hang in shreds, and dirt, rocks, and glass are embedded in the wound. I pick out the larger pieces, but I'm going to need to clean them. I don't see any establishments nearby that would offer public restrooms. I consider heading back to Berman's place to use his bathroom, but I'm not sure I'd be able to manage re-entry. After a few deep breaths to try to lessen the pounding in the back of my head, I take a step and nearly buckle. My right knee took a harder hit than I thought. Putting weight on it is almost unbearable, but I force myself to take another step, and then another, until the movement loosens my swollen joint enough to resume a quick walk. Without my watch, I'm uncertain of my pace or how long I have before Vitaly's goons might start to suspect I've given them the slip. I press on, managing a slow jog, then find a gate that favors my left leg in a sort of skip run. Six miles, I tell myself. After the first mile, I try to calculate how long I'd been running, how fast, and parcel out a portion of my remaining energy to the next mile. At what I guess is the three-mile point, my mantra shifts to a recurring assurance that I'm halfway there, but I'm taken by thirst. The day is getting hotter, and I'm starting to feel a little lightheaded. I know from my running days that I'll be susceptible to cramps if I don't get some water in me, but my route is not runner-friendly. There are no public drinking fountains, and the dingy shops I pass are useless to me without any money. I trudge on, and soon the railroad tracks are in sight, which means I'm less than a mile from the station. I look up at the sun, trying to get an idea of which side of noon I'm on, and guess the hour. But in truth, I have no idea if I've been running for one hour or three. At least I'm heading in the right direction. When the station is in sight, I allow myself to slow to a walk. I'm drenched in sweat, and the inside of my mouth feels like cotton. I pull open the door to the station with my fingertips and limp over to the men's room. It's locked. I look over at the ticket window, and there's a sign letting passengers know they can buy their tickets on the train. I try the drinking fountain, but it offers only a weak trickle. I try to collect some water with the corner of my mouth, but only manage a few drops before I give up. 
The movie theater is another block and a half away. I make my way down the alley toward the back door. There's an usher standing guard. I smile at him and open the door. Sorry, sir. You need to go around front and get a ticket. I have a ticket, I tell him, then reach around to my back pocket and find my stub tucked safely there. Thankfully, the kids who mugged me didn't take it as well. I liberate it with my fingers and hand it to him. He examines it, then takes a look at me. Just stepped out to get some air, I say. He hands me the ticket with a bewildered look, then holds the door open as I limp in. I head for the restrooms and straight for one of the sinks. It has an automatic sensor that operates when your hands are under the faucet. So I hold my damaged palms under it, waiting for the stream to begin. Nothing happens. I try the next sink, then the next one. Finally, I get a stream of hot water to flow. When it hits my hands, they scream in pain. I force myself to let the water flood the wounds until I see the dirt rinsed away from the raw flesh. I take my hands away and stick my mouth under the faucet, but I'm rewarded with just a sip of hot water. I try holding my hand in a way that will trip the sensor while my mouth is in position, and manage to get a couple swallows of the near steaming water, enough to quench my thirst for a bit. I douse my hands with soap from the dispenser, hoping it's the antibacterial variety. It stings, but I force myself to rub my palms gently together until it foams and seeps into every cut, then rinse them once again. There are paper towels, so I grab a few and use them as makeshift bandages. Spots of blood seep through, but for the most part, I think I'm past the worst of it. In the mirror is a sweat-soaked, dirty man with a finely straw-aided scrape across the tip of his nose. I wet a paper towel and dab at it. That's going to be an unavoidable scab for a week or so. Then I feel a bead of sweat trickle down the back of my neck. I grab another paper towel and wipe at it. It's not sweat, it's blood. I press the towel against the growing lump on the back of my head, and it comes back soaked red. I pray that the backdoor usher didn't take it upon himself to call the police or an ambulance or even a manager, but I suspect I would know if he had by now. I apply pressure until the parade of towels I press against the back of my head comes back with only a few spots of blood. It's then that I realize I have lost my hat and glasses somewhere along the way, and the jacket that I had tied around my waist is also missing. Fortunately, the t-shirt I'm wearing is dark and hides the blood. I look at my elbow in the mirror. It isn't bleeding, but I can see signs of swelling when I compare it to my other elbow. I lift up my pant leg to check on my knees. The right one is bloodied, and there is a tear in my pant leg. The left looks okay, but is tender to the touch. Someone enters the bathroom. They eye the pile of bloody paper towels I've accrued on the counter as they pass. I clean up after myself as a few more patrons trickle in. A movie must be lighting out. Seems like a good time to go myself. In the parking lot, I spy Vitaly's men where I left them, and walk as best I can, trying to hide my limp back to my car. I grab the keys from atop the tire where I hid them and open it. Once inside, I take a moment to settle my nerves. I look at the clock in the car. It's almost four. I've been away for nearly three hours. I start the car and drive directly home. 21. Back at the apartment, I chug a cold bottle of water from the fridge, then head straight for the bathroom and carefully peel off my clothes. I stand under a hot shower for what seems like an hour. Then I slip into my robe, fill four bags with ice, and lie down on the bed with one each on my knees, my elbow, and the back of my head. I hear Rebecca enter. She calls up my name. In the bedroom, I answer weakly. She appears at the door, just as puzzled by my condition as the usher at the back entrance of the theater was. It's a long story, I say. Where is your phone? Sally called. She says Roger's been trying to reach you all day. There's something wrong at the office. I sit up and look around. My phone is on the night table where I left it, but when I pick it up, it's dead. I find the charging cord, plug it in, then swing out of bed to my feet, and limp out into the living room where I left my laptop. What happened? she asks. I turn on my computer and wait for it to boot up. I went to Berman's place. Was he there? Did he do that to you? she asks. No, this happened on the way back. I had a little run-in with some local kids. What did you do? Challenge them to a game of rugby? I'm too sore to laugh. The computer comes to life and I open my email. There's a flood of messages from Roger and most of my co-workers. They've been scrambling all morning to figure out why incorrect orders have been flowing out of the warehouse. Stores are complaining. The CEO has been breathing down Roger's neck, and everyone is looking to me for answers. 
and I had been missing in action, planning a murder. Shit, I mutter. Then, in a loud primal scream, Shit, shit, shit! What is it? Rebecca asks. I fucked up, I answer. Somehow I missed something. My phone rings in the bedroom. I race to answer it before it goes to voicemail. Roger's name and picture are on my screen. I answer. Yes, I saw the emails, I say in reply to the barrage of questions on the other end. I can be there in 15 minutes. I listen for a moment. The weight of the situation grows heavier as I hear the anger and disappointment in Roger's voice. I understand. I'm on my way. I end the call and close my eyes. Rebecca sits next to me. What is going on? The new system we lit up last night. There's something wrong. Stores are getting stuff they didn't order and nothing that they did order. There's a million dollars of inventory in the wrong place. And it's all my fault. You can fix it, right? She says. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong. What can I do to help? Can you drive me to the office? I want to get working on this in the car if I can. Of course, she says. Let me help you get dressed. I silently accept her offer, knowing full well that I'm in no position to manage it myself. She redresses the bandages on my hands, helps me into pants and a shirt, and even puts on my socks and shoes. In an odd way, I welcome the attention. It's coming out of love and concern, not violence and death. That's a nice change. 22. By the time I get to the office, I think I've figured out what's wrong. I had been using our staging environment to test the deployment of the new system, and when we switched it on live, I neglected to verify that the data was coming from the production ordering system rather than the database of test orders. Orders were going out that were essentially randomly created to try to simulate peak load conditions. Unfortunately, they in no way reflected reality. But it took two shifts of warehouse workers filling bad orders before the complaints started rolling in from our customers. I present Roger with my findings and a plan of action. It means recalling all the orders that went out, restocking the inventory in the warehouse, then reprocessing the actual orders. It will take two days to fully recover. Roger stands silently behind his desk, shaking his head. Do it, he orders. It's already in motion, I assure him. He looks up at me. The disappointment on his face makes me want to cringe. You know that this will sink your promotion, he says. I nod. Not exactly a newsflash. And my neck is on the chopping block as well, he adds. It was all my fault. I'll take the hit. Just tell me who I have to explain it to. Shit flows uphill, Roger says. Then his expression changes to one of concern. What the hell happened to you? He asks, waving at my visible injuries. Running accident. Took a bad spill. Was that before or after you slipped up on the deployment? After, I admitted. I can't tell you how sorry I am, Roger. If I need to quit to take the heat off you, I will. I'll write up my resignation right now. No way, he answers. You're not getting off that easy. You're going to live in this office until you get this straightened out. Then you and I are going to call every one of our store managers and apologize and explain why this is never going to happen again. Then we'll see if the board still wants blood. If we're lucky, we'll both come out of this with our jobs. I'm sorry, is all I can think to say. He shakes his head. Just fix it. He collapses into his chair and casts his gaze up at the ceiling. I back out of the office and return to my desk. There is a queue of admins and developers waiting to ask me questions and show me reports. They all look at me with a mixture of pity and relief. Relief that it wasn't their fault. 23. By the time I have things sorted out at work, the constant pain in my knees and elbow had diminished to an occasional twinge, and the palms of my hands have scabbed over. Liberal applications of antibacterial ointment have prevented any infection, but my hands are useless for anything besides some light typing and nose-picking. Rebecca is, of course, furious when I tell her this puts off our plans for Berman. Just until I'm healed, I assure her. You're just stalling, she insists. I hold up my hands. No, I'm not. She dismisses my dramatic gesture with a wave of her own hand. Whatever. Rebecca, I implore what do you want me to do? I nearly lost my job. Hell, I nearly lost my life. And you're questioning me? She spins around with a look of adamant defiance. Are you saying it's my fault? I'm not the one who decided it was best to case Berman's apartment alone. 
I'm not the one who fucked up his job because he was Googling how to kill a cheating junkie. If you would have included me, if you would have trusted me, none of this would have happened. I realize she's right. In trying to prevent any unnecessary risk and exposure, I ended up achieving just the opposite. I bow my head, accepting whatever additional berating she has in store for me. Instead, she places a hand on my arm. It is a good plan, though. I'm very proud of you. I lap up her praise. Good serial killer. Good boy. I'll make you a deal, she offers. We'll wait one more week, but if your hands aren't ready by then, I'm the one who'll whack him on the head with the toilet tank lid. What a perfectly reasonable proposition, I think to myself. Of course, I tell her. In a week. Good. She gives me a peck on the cheek, then picks up her purse and grabs her phone. I'll be at Amy's. Her crib arrived and she needs help to put it together. I start to offer my assistance, but Rebecca casts a reminding glance down at my bandaged hands and then smiles. You just get better. I won't be late. And she leaves. I tell myself, the quicker we get this last killing over, the quicker Rebecca and I can resume our lives. Whatever that turns out to be. Thank you for listening to the Dead Kids Club on the Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs Fiction Podcast. If you are enjoying this free presentation, I hope you'll take a moment to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app or Audible and sign up for my email list at bedtimestories.studio. Make sure you rate and review on the apps that allow it and share this podcast with anyone you know who enjoys audiobooks. You can also show your support by purchasing this or any of my other books in paperback or ebook editions on Amazon or the complete audiobooks on Audible. And lastly, if you're a fan of paranormal mysteries, I hope you'll also check out the award-winning Rainy Day Investigation book series, co-written with Arnold Rundick and Lloyd Auerbach, at rainyanddaye.com. That's R-A-N-E-Y and D-A-Y-E dot com. Thanks again, and all the very best.